So good morning, everybody, and welcome to PSG of Mercer County. The Professional Service Group of Mercer County is here for you, anyone who's in a career transition. In addition to being a good Friday morning, it is Aloha Friday. Happy Aloha Friday. So again, welcome, everybody. And today is also National Punctuation Day. Period. End of sentence. That's all I've got to say about that. So today is National Punctuation Day. So as you write your cover letters, your resumes, and any of your other communications, do make sure you use an, uh, proper punctuation. That's something I just wanted to make sure that we highlight. Uh, because uh, when you send messages to people, it is a reflection on you, and you do want it uh, in the best way possible. So today we celebrate proper use of punctuations. Um, PSG of Mercer County is here for anyone in a career transition. Uh, we do per try to provide you with the resources, information, uh, topical presenters on a weekly basis, everything that hopefully will make you more efficient and more effective with your own job search. And so that's what our main goal is here. Um, among the tools and resources that we have is we do have our LinkedIn group. If you are not yet a member of our LinkedIn group, you can search for it in LinkedIn. It is called PSG of Mercer County. And we encourage everybody, especially if you're here visiting us brand new, to look for our group in LinkedIn and request to join the group. And when you request to join, you kind of put in a pending status. Uh, we do check once or twice a week of who's requested. We only let in people that I know who have been to our group here at least one time. Because we're trying to keep the sales people and the list collectors. I don't mean people who are looking for a sales career, but people that are looking to collect names and get access to people only for their own benefit. Everyone in our LinkedIn group has been to at least one of our in-person or virtual meetings. And, uh, it, you know, you can share articles or job leads, post your elevator pitch to introduce yourself, um, maybe a good way to begin to expand your own network and connections. And one thing kind of nice is that if you do reach out to somebody in our group, there's a good chance that they will respond to you. Being a job seeker, they know the value of, of maintaining connections with other people. So right now we're over 1,690 people, almost 1,700. So it's a pretty good group, a great way to increase your number of connections in your network. We do also have a website. It is psgofmercercounty.org, psgofmercercounty.org. It is more than just the landing page. Um, it is over 120 pages of web content, a lot of information that we provide to anybody in a career transition. There are some pages that are kind of focused in New Jersey, but that's really kind of our service area. But we have over 120 pages of content. Uh, we have a menu at the top with six or seven different menu items, so you may easily want to navigate through the web right now. Uh, in there, we do have, uh, at the top, we have something called Open Jobs. It's a menu item called Open Jobs, and that page is divided into two pieces. One is kind of a blog posting of recently posted positions. We do have some people that will periodically post them there. I haven't gotten a lot of activity there lately. And then the second half, a little below that, we have links to um, jobs, or companies, company career pages in seven different counties, Mercer and the six border counties. And so if you click on any of the counties, you can drill down and see links to different company career pages. And among all seven pages, we have over 2,600, 2,600 links. And so the reason why we clicked to their uh, career page is because this way they're maintaining their career pages. We don't have to maintain a career page list as actively, and it's always as current as those companies are maintaining it. Also, you can use those pages to create your own targeted list. So if you're thinking about where might be some interesting companies in this general vicinity, you can just kind of hop through those pages and see if there are companies of interest, a company in your area, create your targeted list. And then after that, you can begin to look for people to contact or positions. So that's another way to use that resource. As for our meeting ground rules today, uh, in just a moment, um, Bill will be sharing his screen. Bill and Sean are both going to be giving uh, the presentation. They will be taking turns. We are going to be using um, the chat for alerting us for Q&A. And so the way we'll do that is in chat, 
you type the word question. If you type the word question, then we'll know it's like you digitally raising your hand and we'll keep an eye on that. And both Bill and Sean are gonna try and uh, answer your questions uh, in very short order. They're not gonna wait a long time. They may have to finish their bullet point or their slide, but they wanna take the questions as current to their uh, topic point as possible. Uh, so Bill, Sean, and myself will be monitoring the chat. So do write the word question. That's like raising your hand. The reason why we ask you to write the word question is it helps stand out from other uh, communication that people do put in the chat. If you don't want to uh, do that, then you could put the word question and then type your question, and then one of us will just read that out loud. But if you just type the word question, we'll ask you to unmute and you can speak with Sean or Bill at that point and ask your question. So that's the way we're going to manage uh, questions. But uh, when you're not doing question and answers, please, of course, keep your microphones on mute just to make sure there is no accidental background noise that may be coming through. You never know if your neighbor's got his leaf blower going and uh, it could interrupt or make a little background noise. And I'll be keeping an eye if there's any disruptions, I will um, just mute someone real fast. Okay, so that is our logistics for the meeting. And so PSG of Mercer County is very pleased to welcome Bill Lachance and Sean Loveson. Bill Lachance is an independent financial advisor. Bill's firm offers a unique flat fee program that combines financial planning, investment management, tax planning, and tax preparation. Prior to launching his financial planning practice, Bill spent 22 years in corporate finance in the retail industry. Before that, he was a CPA with a large accounting firm. Bill has a BS in accounting from Bryant University and an MBA in finance from Indiana University. Bill is a certified financial planner, as well as an enrolled agent authorized to represent taxpayers before the IRS. Sean Loveson joined uh, WJL Financial Advisors as a registered investment advisor agent in December 2020. After spending more than 20 years in corporate finance, including 14 as the CFO of two separate divisions of RPM International. Throughout his career, Sean has always had a passion for personal financial planning, and that's ultimately what led him to joining WJL financial advisors. Sean is a certified public accountant and holds a Series 65 license and has passed the Certified Financial Planner exam in 2020. He's also a member of the Financial Planning Association, a leading professional organization of financial planners. So PSG of Mercer County is very pleased to welcome two terrific job seeker advocates and supporters, Bill Lachance and Sean Loveson. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Let me just get this uh, thing started. Um, everybody else, make sure we can see that okay. Yep. Um, so yeah, this presentation, uh, you know, isn't necessarily designed uh, to cover every possible uh, financial question that may arise uh, during a career transition, uh, but we try to pick on topics that we thought maybe not everybody would be familiar with uh, and try to add value. And as David said, just please, you know, ask questions as we're going along. We tend to find that, uh, you know, works better. So let me just get rolling. It's kind of the uh, a look at the agenda here uh, and then we're going to start with uh, medical. So, uh, you know, uh, medical insurance tends to be an issue for folks in transition unless they have a spouse or a significant other uh, with insurance through work. Uh, they pretty much, most folks have two choices uh, if they're in a job transition. One is to go to COBRA and the other is to go uh, on the exchange and pick a plan through there. You know, most people are pretty familiar with COBRA. Right, COBRA is essentially the same group plan that you were on when you were working. Uh, the law requires that companies offer people leaving uh, group insurance uh, 18 months uh, of coverage uh, on the same coverage, uh, but that the employee would pay for it uh, entirely themselves. Right, normally when you're working, you know the employer is going to uh, kick in a portion of the premiums and you kick in a portion of premiums as the employee. But if you're on COBRA, typically you're paying the entire amount. Although in some cases. You know, companies will offer as part of their severance package, you know, subsidized COBRA. Uh, so the other alternative, right, because I've, as some of you may, may, may are probably aware, right, COBRA can be quite expensive when you're paying 100% is to go on to the exchange. Uh, and you do have that opportunity uh, when you are losing your group, group coverage, you have a 60 day window uh, to go and sign up. Uh, and instead of doing COBRA, go on to the exchange instead. And whether or not the exchange is going to be more affordable uh, than COBRA largely depends on whether you're going to qualify for a subsidy. This chart that I'm showing 
is really what the uh, thresholds were, although that had, the upper threshold has changed for 21 and 22. Uh, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, but um, or even on this slide. But basically, the way it works is, uh, or at least it did work. You know, if your income, let's say for a family of four, was less than 104,800, then you would qualify uh, for a subsidy, a premium subsidy on the exchange. The red uh, middle bucket or bar there, that's where you would qualify for not only a premium subsidy, but if income drops below that threshold. Um, they have uh, what they call cost sharing subsidies kick in, where that lowers your out of pocket costs, lowers your uh, co pays and your deductibles. Uh, and then if you get into the green bar all the way on the left, then you're out of the Affordable Care Act. And those are the thresholds that would qualify you for Medicaid, or in New Jersey, it's called New Jersey Family Care, which doesn't cost anything, um, uh, you know, obviously for low income uh, folks. Um, so the question then is, but with the big change that happened with the law that was passed in March, is that, you know, the American Rescue Plan, is that that upper limit, okay, got, it was a cliff. Uh, so in the old days, let's say, again, you're a family of four and your income came at 106,000 or even 105,000, just a dollar over the threshold, you lost the entire subsidy. So it was really, really difficult for people that were just over these, these thresholds, you know, those upper thresholds. What that law did, at least for 21 and 2022, it's not permanent, is it removed that cliff and now it phases out and it's a kind of a convoluted formula. Uh, but basically it, it phased out a pretty high income. Uh, I have an example on the next slide, but you know, even for a family of four, uh, it could be as high as $300,000 now before the subsidy phases out entirely. So that's gonna make it, uh, you know, the, the uh, ACA plans in a lot of cases, uh, more financially favorable than um, COBRA would be in a large part, right, because of the subsidies that are provided, okay? And what these premium subsidies are, are they really tax credits uh, that are provided to you in advance based on your estimate of the, that year's income? So for 2021, let's say somebody uh, just lost a job and wants to switch over to an Affordable Care Act plan for the rest of 2021, they would basically be, be projecting their 2021 income, not 2020, not 2019, doesn't really matter so much what your income was in the past, it is what is your income going to be this year? Based on your estimate, that determines the subsidy. What the subsidy is, is really a tax credit that the government is giving to you in advance. So you, if you're a single person, let's say you think your income is gonna be 40,000 this year with unemployment and what you worked for the first part of the year or whatever it might be, and you put 40, that's gonna determine your subsidy. Uh, and then what happens is the government pays that subsidy directly to the insurer. Uh, then at the end of the year, okay, you're gonna do your taxes for the year. So now it's March of 2022, you're doing your 2021 taxes, and it turns out your income, instead of you had estimated at 40, it came in at 50, you're gonna to have to pay back some of that subsidy you received uh, by paying, you know, either having a lower refund or a higher payment at tax time. Vice versa, if your income comes in at 30 versus your estimate of 40, okay, you're gonna get more money back at tax time. It's gonna increase that credit. Uh, so it's basically a credit that you estimate based on your income, and then it gets trued up uh, at the end of the year, okay? And that is for the premium credit, okay? That lowers the premium, the monthly premium. In addition, as I mentioned, there's cost sharing credits, right? If you hit certain, um, if you hit certain, uh, you know, hitting those red thresholds, those are, do not get trued up. Um, so if, you know, it turns out you were supposed, you know, you would have had a deductible of 2000, now your deductible is only $500 because of the, uh, you know, income was low enough. It's not as if, if your income came in higher, you have to pay back that $1,500. So if you're really not sure, uh, you know, which way to go, because a lot of times people will say, well, listen, I'm in job transition. I don't know what my, you know, my income is gonna be. So let's say, for example, now we're talking about 2022. And you're trying to say, well, I'm still in gents. I have no idea what my income is going to be next year. I don't know when I'm going to get a job. You know, typically, you're typically going to want to uh, estimate low, in my view, because you just don't know. And I've had situations where folks estimated high, thinking they would get a job. They didn't get a job. Uh, that cost sharing doesn't get trued up either way. So they would have had the lower uh, deductibles and co-pays, but because they overestimated their income, they didn't get that. I see there's a question in the chat. Let me make sure there's not a question here. Uh, oh, that's state. Okay. So, um, 
So anyway, so that was so that basically the the premium subsidy is a uh, tax credit, and and really now, I mean, for for a lot of people, it's gonna it's gonna I mean, it's pretty dramatic, uh, especially if you're you know the 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 subsidies on the exchange are age based. So the, essentially, what it does is it's uh, I'm sorry, the premiums are age based. So if somebody is say 25, they may have a premium of four hundred dollars a month, right? Somebody who is 55 might have a premium of nine hundred dollars a month for that same exact plan, right? Because it, it's it's triggered based on age, okay? Uh, and so so the question then is, um, what they do then is they say, based on your income, they say, we could afford, you could afford $300 a month. So the 25 year old is gonna get a $100 subsidy, okay? And the and the uh, 55 year old, right? I forget what I had used, but say, uh, uh, seven hundred dollars or something, they would get a subsidy, four hundred dollar subsidy, right, to bring them down to three hundred bucks. So, so basically, the whole idea is that um, the subsidies, especially if you're older, which a lot of the folks in job transition are, are going to be pretty significant because uh, it's going to bring your income down quite a bit. Um, uh, question: I would be on Medicaid, which I heard is bitty bad coverage. It's not so much that it's bad coverage; it covers it, the coverage is actually good. Uh, the issue is a lot of doctors don't want to accept Medicaid. Um, so it's not that the coverage itself is bad. It's just that the reimbursement is low for Medicaid. So there are a lot of doctors, particularly in the more affluent areas, that don't want to accept Medicaid. So it's a question of, you know, you have to be less picky about the doctors that you want if you qualify for Medicaid. So I have had people over the years come to me and say, hey, listen, I don't want to go on Medicaid. My income is going to be, you know, $12,000 for the year for a single person. And that's going to throw me to Medicaid. Well, if you have any kind of a, a traditional IRA, you could do something like a Roth conversion, you know, which we'll talk about later, and bring your income up just over the Medicaid threshold. And I've had people do that. So there, there, you can manage your income up pretty easily. Um, it's a little bit trickier, obviously, to get your income down, but it's easy to bring your income up if you choose to and not, you know, no longer qualify for Medicaid. My question, COBRA extends through March 22. Can I apply for the ACA through New Jersey at any time during that period? So, okay, so it's there's the way it normally is and the way there is this year. So the, the question is, you know, do, when do, can you sign up for the ACA? Well, let's, let me talk about a normal year. In a normal year, what happens is you can sign up either A, during open enrollment. So if you were signing up for 2022, you would sign up essentially between uh, November 1. You really have to January 31st, but you really want to get signed in by December 15th to make sure it's effective January 1. So let's, let's say for all intents and purposes, open enrollments November 1 to December 15th for coverage to start right January 1. If you're not in that open enrollment period, then you have to have a special enrollment uh, exception. Okay, so what's a special enrollment exception? Well, one is you lost your job, right? So if you lost your job and you lost your coverage, Okay, you have a 60 day window to sign up. Another one is if you had subsidized coverage, let's say the company subsidizes your COBRA and now that subsidy is ending, that will qualify you for a special enrollment period. And then the other one is, is when your 18 months of COBRA ends. So in a normal year, if you decide to go on a COBRA and the middle of the year decide to change your mind, hey, it would have been less expensive, you can't do it. Now that's a normal year. This year, 2021, because of COVID, um, basically in New Jersey, the entire year is a special enrollment period. So anybody can sign up for the ACA, right, at any time uh, during the year. Uh, and if you have COBRA, you could just drop the COBRA and jump on. But that's only this year uh, because of COVID. Okay. Uh, and so, Bill, Bill, this yes, is Greg. I, I asked that question about the uh, COBRA coverage. Can I just do yeah, a yeah. follow-up real quick? Yeah, yeah, so, sure. So I think it's important. So uh, my 12 months of subsidized COBRA is ending, and then I begin a six-month period of unsubsidized. So I think based on what you just said, if the company's subsidy goes away, then you have, you know, you're able to make that change at that point in time. Is That's that correct. correct. That's a qualifying event. You just have to prove it to them, right? They're going to say, what, what is your special enrollment? And then you're just going to have to show them some documentation that says, you know, this was subsidized and the subsidy is ending, you know, October 31st, and therefore that becomes a qualified event. Now, again, this year you don't need that because it doesn't matter. You can sign up because of COVID exception. But starting next year, again, I haven't heard that that would be ex expanded to 2022. Starting next year, that would be the case, right? You'd have to decide, you know, if, if your subsidy, subsidy runs through, let's say, March, then you got a little bit of a tricky uh, decision to make because 
if you're going to want to switch in March, now you're going to start with a whole new deductible. So then you got to decide how much is that subsidy worth, right? Versus the, the um, you know, your COBRA subsidy versus what you're going to get on a subsidy on the exchange. And are you better off just switching in January and not waiting till March? Because if you wait, wait till March, you're going to start with a whole new deductible again. So the math gets a little bit tricky. And by the way, I help people with all this. So if you, you know, it's basically a little, I'm a financial advisor, but I have this little side business that I've been working on the last few years, helping people with health insurance. No charge to you. I get you know commission from the insurance companies if you sign up. So if anybody does need help navigating through all that, certainly free to, you know, reach out. Um, Thanks, Bill. Sure. And then, um, so the one other thing is I talked about the cost sharing subsidy. If your is, income is low enough to qualify for that, you can only get that cost sharing subsidy on a silver plan. They basically have different tiers of plans on the exchange. They got bronze, they got silver, and they got gold. And the way it works is, you know, with a bronze plan, you have the lowest premium, but the highest out of pocket. With a silver plan, it's kind of in the middle, and the gold plan has the highest premiums, the lowest out of pocket. Now, the insurance companies are indifferent. Right. They price these things so that on average, right, somebody, you know, selecting a bronze plan is ultimately going to pay the same as somebody selecting a gold plan or it's going to earn them the same. It's just a question of whether they get a higher premium and a lower out of pocket or vice versa. Right. But for you as an individual, it might make a difference. Right. So you've got to kind of look at your specific situation to figure out which plan would be the optimal. But if you are going to qualify for a cost sharing subsidy, they only offer that on that silver plan, that middle tier, uh, something to be aware of. And then obviously you've got to look at all your costs, right? So if you're trying to decide between the exchange and Cobra, you got to look at everything, right? What is your um, premium going to be? What is your out-of-pocket going to be? You know, when I when I did it, when I, I made the switch, when I my job was limited back in 2013, um, and I had to decide, do I want to stay on Cobra and pay or switch to exchange? And I did the math and I downloaded all my uh, transactions, right, from the year before, and I kind of ran through it and figured out, okay, it would be better off for me on the exchange. So I did drop my Cobra and switch to the exchange back in like 2014. Um, and as I said, the uh, the upper limits there don't apply for 2021 and 2022. Okay. So there's just a few more uh, points about this American Rescue Plan and the impact. As the big one I just mentioned already, right? The in income eligibility cliff went away for, for these for two years. OK, and that's really a big deal. It's kind of been underreported, in my view, in the news. This is a really big deal, in my view, and really helped, you know, increase the affordability of health insurance across the country for folks, especially those who are trying to, that are done, you know, working in a corporate world and kind of want to start their own business. There's always that constraint of what am I going to do with my health insurance? Right. And this one really, as your income goes up, yes, your your premiums will go up, but at a reasonable amount. Right. Versus before you went one dollar over the cliff and then it was just it, it could cost you another thirteen thousand dollars a year just by a hundred extra hundred dollars of income. It was crazy the way it was set up before. Um, but they also at the time also increased the credits uh, for those uh, with incomes below the uh, you know the threshold is four hundred dollars. Four hundred percent of the poverty threshold was what triggered you know you being eligible for a subsidy in the past. But even for folks that did eligible previously. They got increased credits with the new law. Uh, there's a big exception for this year uh, that, that you know, again, even somebody who's who's thinking about it, well, it's only two or two, three more months of the year left, may not be worth switching now. Well, if you even collected one month of unemployment in 2021, the model now assumes that you're going to have income just over the Medicaid threshold, meaning you're going to get maximum subsidy, maximum uh uh, premium subsidy and maximum cost sharing subsidies. And the numbers are pretty dramatic. I mean, literally uh, somebody, you know, if it's a single person, you're talking about premiums of $3 a month, right? And maybe an out-of-pocket, I mean, a, a deductible of $400 and maybe an out-of-pocket of $800 for the entire year. So your total out-of-pocket possible is less than probably one month of COBRA. Uh, and I know that, you know, uh, you know, this was my next point, right? COBRA, was subsidized, right? Part of this American Rescue Plan from April through uh, September 30th, right? Which is just coming up on an ending here. So if you're in one of those situations where COBRA was subsidized, right? And now all of a sudden you're, it's not gonna be subsidized. You know, you do, you probably do wanna take a hard look at it. Would it make sense for this last three months to switch to exchange? Cause you could end up saving quite a bit of money, especially if your COBRA is gonna end at some point anyways. And at some point you'd have to switch to the exchange. Um, and this is more for somebody who hasn't filed their 2020 taxes yet, did an extension. Uh, there is no 
uh, repayment. Uh, so it's like I said, if you underestimated your income or so you're over, yeah, underestimated income rather, and now you owe some money back, like I talked about for 2020, you don't have to pay it back. They gave you a free pass. So if you had set up it and underestimated it, uh, you basically got a pass on that. Okay. Couple of more uh, topics related to medical. Um, so the IRA does allow uh, once in your lifetime to transfer money from an IRA to an HSA up to the HSA annual limit. Um, and for those who are not familiar with, an HSA really is the greatest investment vehicle out there. Um, for those who are not familiar, HSA, which is different than a flexible spending account. So flexible spending account, um, you know, would, would need to be offered by employer, could be offered really with any, any kind of health insurance plan where you would essentially put money aside pre-tax, okay, and then you could use that and save tax on your disbursements. But it's typically use it or lose it, although they have some exceptions this year about extending some of that. But, but typically it's use it or lose it. So you've got to figure out how much you're going to do. And if you end up deferring too much, and then, then you kind of lose it, right? So it's a little tricky. An HSA is a different animal altogether. An HSA is a separate account, right, typically with a bank that's separate from the employer, or you can open up an HSA if you're an HSA eligible plan on the exchange as well. The difference is it has to be an HSA eligible plan, which means it's a high deductible plan. And it's not just any high deductible plan, there's specific criteria to make it HSA eligible. And, and the idea of it was, is that there, you know, there's this belief that people you know, have higher deductible plans are gonna be more judicious about going to get medical care. Right. Whether that's a good or bad thing, you know, I, I'm not going to debate, but that's the theory. And therefore, as an incentive to get people to sign up for high deductible plans, they offer this HSA where you could put money in for a single person up to thirty six hundred for a family, which is really anyone more than one person up to seventy two hundred a year. Uh, plus, there's a catch up if you're over age fifty five of a thousand dollars. So you can put a fair amount of money into the HSA and then you get a tax deduction for that. Or if you're doing it through work, it's pre tax. OK. But unlike an, unlike an IRA or a 401k, when you pull the money out, it's not taxed. So it's not taxed going in and it's not taxed coming out. So it's really the best, in, from a tax standpoint, investment vehicle out there. And I actually recommend it for all my clients, right? If they're eligible for it, assuming the math makes sense now, it's still got to make sense that the higher deductible plan makes sense for your family. But assuming that it does and you're eligible for an HSA, you want to typically max that out if there's any way possible. Um, now, in this case, they're allowing you to actually transfer money from an IRA, right, to an HSA. Uh, now, of course, you don't get a tax deduction for that because that money in the IRA was pre-tax to begin with. Uh, but it, it is something that if somebody was tight on cash, uh, that is a way to fund their uh, medical expenses for the year because then that money can be drawn, withdrawn tax-free. And you also don't have to worry about, you know, the, the penalty for which you're on from an IRA potentially. Okay. And I did that actually when I, you know, my my uh, first year out uh, when I started this business. But so then uh, another uh, point is that if you withdraw from a 401k and RRA, you don't have to pay the 10% penalty if it's used for medical expenses in excess of uh, the 10% of modified adjusted gross income. It's actually seven and a half percent. I thought I fixed it on that slide, but somehow I got the slide decks uh, turned around here. But uh, it's really seven and a half percent. Uh, and then the other thing is, is that if you make it a draw from an IRA, you can use to pay your medical insurance premiums uh, and not subject to 10% penalty uh, if you've been collecting unemployment for at least 12 weeks. Uh, but that's only for an IRA, not for a 401k. Okay. So Bill, you do have one question uh, from Joe. Like when you transfer from an IRA to an HSA, it doesn't incur a tax event. No, it would not be taxable. No, because if you're basically putting money from a pre-tax uh, IRA to a pre-tax HSA. So there's no taxable event. And the difference, of course, is now when you pull the money out of the HSA, of course, it needs to be for medical expenses. But once you pull it out, that's not taxable either. Whereas if you pull the money out of the IRA, that is taxable. So that's the advantage of doing it is you're able to basically you're able to access your IRA money uh, for your medical expenses uh, up to that limit uh, without having to pay any tax on it. I mean, like on that, where I say you don't have to pay the 10% penalty, you don't have to pay the penalty, you still have to pay the tax if you pull out of the IRA. If you pull, if you move it to the HSA first, um, then you don't have to pay the tax or the penalty. Now, if you have enough money in a, in a like a savings account to fund the HSA, what I have to transfer from the IRA, that's even better because now you're getting a tax deduction and the money's coming out uh, tax-free. But if you don't have that cash available, this is one way to, to fund that HSA. All righty, I'm gonna pass it on 
to Sean. All right, thank you. Um, the last two years have been a busy time for tax legislation. Um, you know, each one of these bills has been massive, the longest being over 5,000 uh, pages. I'm just trying to highlight several things that might impact this audience from each one of these acts. So the first one uh, was a major legislation that passed in December of 2019 called the SECURES Act. It's a tortured acronym standing for setting every community up for retirement enhancement. I'm going to try to go through all these acronyms because they're they're boring and stretched. But uh, it eliminated the maximum age for IRA contributions. So that used to be 70 and a half. But assuming you have earned income, you can continue to make IRA contributions past that now. It also increased the age for RMDs from 70 and a half to 72, which is a, a big boon for people who do not need that money. It gives them another two years, really, to do tax planning. Um, and now they're offering more annuity products in 401ks. That's pretty much for all ages. So a lot of people that are in corporate 401ks, you might see more annuity products aimed towards you. Part of what they're doing to help market those plans is providing this lifetime income disclosure statement, which is really them trying to estimate if you annuitize all of your 401k balance, how much income that would be. Um, you know, I want to highlight this as something that, you know, you should be aware of because it's not always a good option to switch over those annuity products that do have higher fees than just some of the low cost index funds. So it might not be the right fit for you. So you just want to be careful of, of what they are pitching to you inside those plans. Um, they're also allowing qualified distributions from IRAs of 5000 to support the birth of a child or adoption. Uh, now that is still taxed, but you don't have the 10% penalty. Um, from 529s now, if you have any balance left out there, but your kids or you have student loans outstanding, you can use those, that 10,000 to pay off the loans up to 10,000 from a 529 balance. Of course, you still have the option to roll that 529 onto a, a, a different family member, whether that be a grandchild or someone else. So that's also an option. Um, a very unfavorable change of the SECURE Act is if you do inherit a uh, IRA from a parent or, you know, you leave it to a child, um, if they're within 10 years of you, you cannot, I'm sorry, if they're not within 10 years of you, um, there is a 10-year period that you have to eliminate that IRA, meaning that you have to take the distributions from that IRA over 10 years instead of stretching it out over your own lifetime. Um, so you do can determine when you get those IRA distributions. You could do zero for the first nine and take it all in the 10th year, uh, but it allows you a little bit of flexibility to plan, but you don't have as much flexibility as you did in the past. Uh, so I know one question that came in on the previous slide. Uh, can I pay okay. COBRA HCA premium from my HSA account? Uh, and then the answer is uh, COBRA, yes. Uh, COBRA, um, uh, you basically, uh, can use HSA. You cannot use your HSA to pay for your uh, exchange premiums. But here's the thing about the HSA. The HSA stays with you forever, okay? And then you ultimately will use it because you can use the HSA to reimburse yourself for your Medicare premiums. So the reason I encourage you from my clients is, hey, you're, all, you're eventually going to use it up, right? And it's going to grow tax-free. You can invest it in mutual funds just like you do with an IRA. You can say, I want to buy, you know, Vanguard index fund and Put your HSA in that and just wait and, and use it later. Um, and then to so question, oh, hold on, let me just make sure. Uh, question, if HSA, you do not use it, who gets the money, the company? Um, no, you always get the money, right? So that, that's, think about it like a, an HSA is like an IRA for health costs. It's your account. It's separate from anything else. And you basically own that account for the rest of your life. It's just a question of when you draw the money out. And like I said, if you draw it out, you can use it for Medicare. The other thing, the other provision that makes it very favorable is that let's say you're 65 and you pull money out for something other than health insurance, you don't have to, or health costs, you don't have to pay uh, a penalty, you just have to pay the tax, meaning it's exactly the same as an IRA or a 401k. It's pre-tax going in, you gotta pay the tax, but really most, most people are gonna be able to use it up in their lifetimes because they can use it for Medicare, okay? Um, and it, yes, and you can transfer, Oh, to an IRA? That I don't believe you can go that way. But you can transfer to another HSA, right? So if you know you're in a in a HSA that they made you get to at work, and now all of a sudden you want to switch to a different HSA that's got lower fees, you could easily do that. You can you could do a rollover to a new HSA just like you do a rollover with an IRA. And then um, can I start a new HSA anytime? Well, yes, but here's the caveat. You have to be in an HSA eligible plan. 
So there are HSA eligible plans, for example, on the exchange. And that's one of the variables that we look at. Like when I'm working with people trying to decide which is the best plan to pick, the HSA option is something we consider in the math, right? So we would look and say, okay, you're going to be able to, to shelter, you know, uh, $4,500 a year into the HSA. You're in the 12% tax bracket. That's going to be worth X, right? Because they're not going to pay tax on that money, okay? And how does that factor into, again, looking at the premiums and deductibles? It's just another factor in the equation about which is the best plan to pick um, and whether, and, and there's a value to having that HSA because of the tax shelter. Um, but yes, you can do it without an employer, but you have to be in an HS eligible plan. That's the big caveat. And then, uh, Sean, I guess the next question is for you. Any stress? You, for the you, have, you have one more about the uh, contributions to an HSA, even if enrolled in a high deductible plan for only half the year, can they still contribute the whole amount? So, yeah, okay, typically it's prorated, right? So if you're only in uh, for four months into an HSA plan, you're only allowed to do four twelfths of whatever the maximum is for the year. But they have an exception that if you're in an HSA as of December 1, okay, you're deemed to have been in there the entire year. So it really depends on whether you were there for the first half or the second half. If you were there for the first half of the year, let's say you were in there from January through June, then you could put half of the annual amount in. If you were there from June, July through December, then you could put the full amount in. Honestly, even if you were in there just for December, you could put the full amount. As long as you were in, uh, you had the HSA open on December 1, you could fund it for the full year. Okay, so then I think we have a couple questions about the uh, stretch provision that I can answer here. So the stretch provision is that previously when you inherited an IRA from a parent, a grandparent, whoever it might be, you could stretch out that IRA over the duration of your lifetime. Um, so if the person was only 10, they could go all the way out until they, uh, you know, their lifetime of 90 years or whatever the IRS table says their lifetime would be. Um, they've eliminated that. And so that was called the stretch provision for IRAs. So what they've done is they've eliminated that and they've shorted, they've shortened the duration to 10 years. Um, now there are some uh, exceptions to that. Like in this case, my 10 year old example would actually not classify because he's a minor child. So a minor child can actually, you know, continue to stretch that out. But for an immediate child, if the parent was um you know 80 and the child was 50 that person can no longer stretch it out they must use a 10-year duration because they're not a qualifying exception to that rule um now i think that the other question was asked any stretch provision for 401k beneficiary um again no because the, the problem becomes that when they inherit the 401k they're going to have to roll it over into an ira at that point anyway it becomes a, an inherited ira there's no such thing as an inherited 401k um, now, you know, the exception to that rule, though, is that if it is like the spouse, they can use the stretch provision still. So if you're thinking about what happens to your 401k if you pass away and it goes to your wife, then they continue to have the stretch provision. I think that I've answered, does that answer everyone's questions about those? I think that I've gotten them all, but... Uh, I think we're good. Okay. All right, so we've, we've talked a lot about HSAs and FSAs already. So one thing I should just note here about this CARES Act, a lot of the stuff in the CARES Act was stimulus related and that those, those have already expired. But one thing that's permanent on the books is that qualified medical expenses for both HSAs and FSAs have been expanded to include certain over-the-counter medications as well as medical supplies. So about this time of the year, you should be reviewing your FSA spending, especially for flexible spending accounts, because as Bill mentioned, that's more of a use it or lose it account. And you wanna make sure that you're on pace to use the money that you set aside in those accounts. Um, and if you have not used the, that money, you know, then now uh, they've expanded this, this rule so that you can now consider over-the-counter medications as part of that. You know, it's probably going to get hard to reach a large balance if you have to use it, but every little bit helps to make sure that you don't lose those balances. Um, Bill kind of mentioned HSAs. In a perfect world, you would not necessarily look for new ways to take money out of FSAs because it does continue to grow tax-free and you can, can use it later when you have uh, more qualified medical expenses uh, in retirement or at another point. But for F FSAs, now is a good time to do some year-end planning. So. Go the next slide. There we go. So the CAA, uh, this was passed in December 2020. 
So this allows some things I just want to highlight, including the $600 above the line charitable deduction added for 2021. There was a $300 deduction that was added in 2020, and this has been expanded to 600. Now, although it is 300 per person, so that 600 is for married filing jointly. Uh, but again, last year in 2020, that was capped at 300. Um, they've, and they've increased the AIG limit for charitable deductions, so you can, um, you know, have charitable contributions up to 100% of your AIG if that is something that you were considering, although it usually is a bad idea because you're eliminating income at the lowest tax brackets as well, but they did add that. Uh, medical expenses, if you itemize, you can deduct medical expenses above the 7.5. Bill mentioned this earlier. Um, this had been bouncing around between 10% and 7.5%, and they officially, quote unquote, finalized it as long as you know tax bills can ever be final at the 7.5%. Um, additionally, health and dependent care, flexible spending accounts, this is the FSAs we've been talking about, they've added the option to roll those balances forward from 2020 to 2021 and balances from 2021 to 2022. Uh, but this is optional for employers. I think that most major employers have made that change, uh, but it is optional for them. So before you take that in writing, then you want to make sure that um, you, know, you check with the employer's plan first. Um, you got a question there, uh, Sean, did you see that? Yeah, I see one. So if a spouse inherits an IRA, is the 10-year threshold applicable? No. So that, you know, they will be able to stretch it over their lifetime. This is more for if the person is outside of 10 years. It's also, um, it's like a double 10-year thing. But if they are outside of 10 years of the deceased age, so the spouse would, you know, does qualify as someone who can stretch that provision out for their lifetime. So no, that um, that disallowance does not qualify for them. So uh, the CAA continued. If you have uh, children uh, with loans or you have outstanding student loan debt, you know they added some provisions here for for you as well. The CAA does not contain any student loan debt forgiveness from the CARES Act. Um, you know that you know it doesn't mean that they are going to. Um, you know they're not forgiving any loans, and they also ended the deferral provision, which was in September. Uh, so student debt holders must have to resume payments. Um, then they added a provision from the CARES Act that allowed employers to make tax-free payments up to 52,000, I'm sorry, 52,000, 5,250 towards their employees' student debt. And that's been extended through 2025. So what's interesting about this provision is I think this is going to allow some opportunity for some people looking for jobs, especially younger workers that have outstanding student loans to negotiate with their employers to have their employers pay off some of their student loan debt. Um, I think this is going to be useful for, for some people because I think this is to make up for the fact that younger workers don't usually have dependents and they're not able to take away like some of the dependent care deductions that you know parents sometimes have access to. So this is a way for them to get some tax-free benefits from their employers if their employers participate. But just something to keep in your mind if, if you have younger children or you have student loan balances outstanding, it might be something you can try to negotiate. Um, if you have anybody that's applying for financial aid, the FAFSA application process has been simplified from 108 uh, questions down to 36 because they're trying to um, you know, get more families to actually apply for financial aid. And they've re, they've rebranded the expected family contribution to the student aid index uh, because of the negative connotations that they felt that parents were being guilted into feeling that they had to contribute these amounts. So this is more semantics than anything else. But um, you might, you, if you're used to hearing expected family contribution, you won't hear that anymore. Um, They've also formalized who can receive Pell Grants, so it's more black and white instead of an application process that you didn't know. Uh, they've eliminated the uh, above the line deduction for qualified tuition expenses, and, but they've increased the phase out ranges for the uh, lifetime learning credit to match the American Opportunity Tax Credit. And uh, now, if any students, because of COVID or any future issues, are granted emergency financial aid grants by an institution, these will not be included in the student's gross income. Um, you know, I had some, some friends and clients that you know, fell into this with children who were um, teaching assistants and they were issued grants during COVID. 
And there was a little bit of concern that that might have been income that they would have to pay taxes on, but they have formalized the fact that that will not be considered uh, income. I'm sorry, just leading the chat thing to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. All right, CAA continued. The other treatment changes is that mortgage insurance premiums will be uh, counted as qualified residence interest through 2021. They've also extended the 10% credit for non-qualified business energy property, although there is a $500 lifetime cap. So if you previously used that, then we will no longer qualify or you can't get additional credits, I should say. Um, and they've also extended the residential energy efficient property credit. You know, I think primarily this, this is a good one for people in New Jersey to, to really consider in terms of solar. And they've increased it from 22% to 26% uh, for 2021 to 2022. And then it goes down to 22% until 2023. Um, if you haven't looked into solar, you know, it is probably a good thing aside from the tax credit to look into. Um, New Jersey is a very generous um, state for the solar energy credits they issue. So just something to consider as well. And then we have the American Rescue Plan, which was passed in March of 2021. Uh, this was another round of stimulus. It had um, extended it per dependence, so the amount really did increase, uh, with, but it has a shorter phase-out range. Now, there were three different opportunities to actually uh, receive this. Although it passed in 2021, you know, it was before the filing deadline for 2020. So you had a chance of getting it off of your 2019 uh, AIG or AGI. And then you had a chance for your 2020 if you didn't qualify for the 2019. And if you still, if this year you're gonna have lower income in 2021, you have another chance to get it when you file your 2021 tax return. So there's three different checkpoints as they call them that possibly qualify for this stimulus payment. Um, and then they've made major changes to taxpayers with children or dependents. Although these right now are only for 2021, um, you know, you probably see some version of these in the final bill get extended or anything else. But um, they've enhanced the amount per child from 2,000 to 3,000 with an additional amount, uh, additional amount for children under the age of six of $600. So for a child under the age of six, they could, you know, get a tax credit of up to 3,600. Although there are different phase out ranges for both the base amount of 2000 and these additional amounts or the enhancements. So it's a rather complicated calculation. Not everybody qualified for the enhancement, um, but for the people to do it, it is quite an increase. They've also increased the age by one year for dependents from age 16 to age 17. So if you have a 17 year old in your house, God bless you, but you also do qualify for an additional tax credit. Um, and they also decide to prepay 50% of the, the tax credit to filers um, from, uh, what was that, January through December. And um, so people that qualify should have been receiving checks. It should be noted that unlike this direct stimulus payments that were made, these child tax credit advancements, um, they can claw those back. So if you ended up qualifying last year, but your income went up in this year and you no longer qualified, um, part of that amount could be added back to your tax bill in, uh, in April. So you just want to be aware of that. Um, additionally, they made uh, changes to the dependent care expense deduction. They increased the total amount allowed from 3,000 up to 8,000. So it's a major increase. And they've also increased the applicable percentage. Although there are phase out ranges on that as well, that uh, you know, it takes most taxpayers back down to what they were before. but um you know if you qualify that could be an additional increase for you uh john has a question about uh what's qualified non-business energy property yeah so i listed some of the the items that could be qualified for that you know you can think about insulation but they also include roofing they include um uh, any kind of windows, doors, skylights that meet uh, the energy saver requirements. You, you can find a list um, on the IRS of things that qualify. But almost everything that you would think about that qualifies for, you know, lowering your energy bill will qualify for that. Uh, but if you have had any kind of roofing done, that's probably the most major expense that people have in there that will qualify. But I qualified by throwing a couple, you know, bats of insulation in the unfinished part of my attic to, to, you know, 
you get that deduction back in 2019. Uh, so if you are thinking about any kind of those projects, this could just give you a, a slight credit and help offset those costs. Uh, okay, the other one's just a comment. Okay, um, the last thing that was done in the American Rescue Plan is formalize the discharge student loan debt will continue to not be counted as income. Um, you know, that people are, are speculating this is going to set the stage for Biden to do an executive order for giving some student loan or put it into a future package. Uh, but it actually has no immediate impact for most people because there are no provisions on the books right now to actually provide loan forgiveness. But just wanted to highlight this because it could possibly set the stage for something to happen later. All right, so now we have the actual action items or strategies to, um, that you can do in the current year, depending on what's happening with your income. This, this first slide is if you expect to be in a lower tax bracket this year. So an important part of this, of this slide and the next slide is um, actually figuring out what your tax bracket is now and forecasting what it is going to be for the current year. You know, if you do your taxes yourself, you can find plenty of free tools, TurboTax has several things on their websites to estimate your tax bracket. If you have your taxes done by somebody, you can contact, you know, whoever that might be. You know, Bill and I do this as well. Uh, but it's important to figure out where you are, where you are now, and where you're going to be in order to kind of utilize these tax strategies. But if you expect to be in a lower tax bracket, you know, this year, uh, because maybe you were in a 24% tax bracket last year, and now you think you're going to be in a 12% tax bracket this year because of several months of unemployment. Or if you were in a 35, and now you're in the 24. All of those, you know, are in considerations for you to to do something right now. Um, one thing you can do if you're in a lower tax bracket now is take Roth conversions um, into an IRA up to an amount that will fill up that lower tax bracket. So if you're in the 12% tax bracket, figure out how much income you have to make in order for you to move up to the 24 and actually take Roth conversions to increase your income to that level so that you're only taxed at the 12% and you lock that in by putting it into a Roth uh, IRA. Um, another consideration that you might have is sell investments. You know, if you have investments at a gain, I know that in our, you know, intro conversations some people talk, we were talking about holding individual stocks. You know, if you have individual stocks or mutual funds that have large gains built in, you know, you can lock in that lower capital gains rate now because the extent you're at 12% bracket, your long-term capital gains rate will be 0%. Um, if you're over 59 and a half, you can withdraw money from your IRA and, uh, you know, pay taxes now on that. So that would be moving it into a brokerage account or your savings account, you know, not rolling it over to a Roth, but actually taking it out as income and locking in that lower rate. Um, if you've separated from your company at age 55 or over, you can withdraw that money from your 401k and pay taxes at your lower rate now without incurring the 10% penalty. So that's very similar to the IRA comments above. You could also uh, pay your quarterly estimated taxes in January and defer payments of real estate taxes until January. So meaning that if you can push off any December payments into the next year being 2022, you get the deduction next year instead of this year when you already have lower income that the deduction might not be worth as much. Um, now also this is just more of a tax consideration when you file your taxes. You might be eligible now for credits that you might not have been previously eligible for. Uh, just something to consider when you're filing your taxes later. Um, so there's a question about the energy credit. No, that will not lower your basis in your in your home. So that's not that's you don't have to worry about that. And I should just mention that it could actually, if you do good record keeping, that would increase the basis in your home because assuming that that is an investment in your home that is not something that's a maintenance and repair item, you know, all the money you're putting into there, into your home, whether that be new windows or uh, insulation or anything else, will actually increase your basis, not not reduce it. So, but isn't that a double credit? <clears throat> What's that? Isn't that yeah, a double the question? Yeah. Yeah, I have, to, I have to follow up on that one because I'm not 100% sure. I've never actually run into that, Carol, but you're right. She's asking the fact that, okay, you, you, you spent money on a whatever, some improvement that costs 10000 You get a credit for $1,000. Did you really, can you really increase your basis by 10 or do you only increase it by 9 Exactly. 
I'd have maybe. to double check on that one. I, I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, uh, I don't think so, but I think Sean might be right. But that's a good question. I'm logically, you're right. You'd be getting a double benefit, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I find it very hard for them to figure out that 500 credit base is different. Oh yeah, no, they won't find uh, it. You're right. It'd be a question about whether technically, yeah, I'd, I'd have to think about that one. And do a little for five hundred dollars. I wouldn't lose sleep either way. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. If you take a, uh, a distribution from the four hundred one k, that's what you're saying. And if we answer this, is this the um, this is the second slide? This is a higher tax bracket slide. Sorry to throw you off. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, no, I'm looking at Maria Force's uh, question. If you take a distribution from your 401k, does it offset your unemployment? Meaning, do you need to report the amount of the withdrawal to your the two unemployment? Man, I'm not sure if I've ever run that across that bill. Have you? Do you know if you have to report a the 401k distribution as income? Yeah, to yeah that's an income? issue. Uh, yeah, a four because a 401k is considered uh, an employer, you know, uh, portion. Theoretically, the employer portion of the unemployment distribution would be income and would affect your uh, your uh, unemployment amount, right? So the, 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 the way around that, if that's going to be an issue for you, is just to roll that money to an IRA. An IRA is not considered an employer account. And so if you're going to run into an issue where a 401k distribution could affect your unemployment, just roll it to the 401 uh, IRA and take it out of the IRA. And then you avoid that problem. Uh, Joe has just has a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting. It's a, he's yeah. building the suspense for the question. Okay. With the question, can you, if you are collecting Social Security and working, can you see about having money, your income from that work put into deferred income so you can still max out the Social Security if you're below age 70? Um, I mean, it, that whole thing is just a timing difference show, right? I mean, it, it just means that you're not collecting it now and you're just going to get it more later. Uh, so it's not that big of a deal, you know, the offset. Um, but I do believe that, yes, uh, if you put money, well, the first question is, what you know, you rob, you probably don't want, that's going to be a topic for a later slide. You really don't want to take it before four week time age to begin with. But, but if you did, um, I do believe it's based on your reported income so that if you if you take deferred comp to lower your income, that will lower the Social Security offset. Well, I'm in a unique spot because at age 60, I can collect half of my late ex-wife's Social oh. Security. And if I continue to work, I'd be looking to put into deferred, the deferred right. income. Yeah, I think you can. I, I, I'm pretty sure, and I have run into this, this is what I want to have to research, right? Um, Pretty sure it's based on the actual reported income on the W-2. So if you defer it and now your reported W-2 income is lower now, well, but that's not the case for Social Security. If you defer, you still have to pay the Social Security tax. I'd have to do some homework on that one, Joe, to be honest. Uh, my gut tells me you you may not be able to get around it because if you defer, what happens is your, your taxable income goes down, but your Social Security wages don't go down. You pay Social Security taxes, when you earn it, even if you end up deferring and pay income taxes later. So my gut tells me, and I'd have to double check it, that you, you're you not gonna solve that social security issue um, because they probably use social security wages, right? To determine that, but I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to look at that such, yeah, never run into that before. In five years when I get to that point. Yeah, 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 we'll, we'll sort it out, right? But that's, that's one, that one, yeah, that's like a unique thing. Even trying to figure that out and trying to get anybody at Social Security that's going to know the answer to that is going to be near impossible, to be honest with you. But um, they can change. The, I'm 55. They can change the laws in the next five years. So I'm going yeah. to worry about it as I get but, closer. Yeah, I wanna, okay. yeah, it's a very unique situation. So I'm not sure, to be honest. With you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now we have if you expect to be in a higher tax bracket in the current year. So a lot of this is is logically just the reverse of what we just talked about in the previous slide. You know, now you want to try to make uh, you know as many pre-tax contributions to tax deferred investment accounts as you can. So a pre-tax IRA, a traditional IRA, and of course the HSAs that we've been talking about at great length. At great length. So you know you might be in a, tire, in a higher tax bracket this year because of a deferred compensation payout, additional bonuses, whatever you might have. 
Um, so now you want to try to fill up all your pre-tax buckets and lower your uh, taxable income. Um, if you can, def de delay deferred compensations from you know, your current employer to the next year if possible. Uh, prepay your January mortgage payment to increase your mortgage interest deduction. So this is the reverse of what we talked about in the last slide where we were pushing it out into January of next year. Well, this time you're trying to pull in January into the current year. Um, you can utilize donor advised funds to lump charitable deductions. Um, so now donor advised funds, for those of you that don't know, it's a separately uh, set up account at um, you know, uh, whatever your brokerage, Fidelity, Schwab, whatever it might be that you control the fund, but you get to take the deduction in the current year as if it was a charitable contribution right now. So let's just say in an example, you gave $3,000 each year to your church. And they rely on that, that $1,000 each year. So you don't necessarily want to give them the $3,000 now because it hurts their planning. You prefer to give it to them you know, $1,000 each year so that they can plan for it. Well, you can donate the full $3,000 to the donor advised fund right now take the $3,000 deduction in the current year, and then you can distribute it to them $1,000 per year um, over the next three years so that they have the money when they need it to um, plan for it. So that's an, a, a way that they, you can pull your donations forward into the current year. You could pay quarterly estimated state income taxes in December instead of January. So again, you're, you're pulling in uh, your real estate tax bill a lot of places send those bills to you in December to give you that opportunity. Um, then you could also sell investment to the loss. So if you have any um, individual stocks or mutual funds that you have a loss in, you can sell those, recognize up to $3,000 in losses against your ordinary income in the current year. And if it is mutual funds, you can purchase a similar but a not identical investment and avoid the wash sale rules. So if you have the Vanguard S&P 500 fund, you could sell that and then buy the Fidelity S&P 500 fund and avoid a wash sale issue. Um, let's see here. Question, I'm assuming I cannot contribute to an employer 401k if you're an employee. That is correct. You can't continue to contribute to a 401k if you're not an employee, but you could set up an IRA or some other account depending on what your income is coming from. Um, don't write something. Okay, last one was just a comment. Okay, this is back to you, Bill. All right, so, uh, you know, one topic that comes up, right, for folks that are in job transition is, you know, what do I do with my 401k or my 403b, right? Should I keep it in a 401k? Should I roll it over to an IRA? So you just talk a little bit about the pros and cons, right? So with a 401k, um, you know, there are really two advantages that, I, that we see anyway. One is the availability of loans, right? You can borrow against a 401k, for those not familiar, you could borrow up to up to 50% of your balance, up to $50,000, right? Although I think they made an exception. They bumped it up to 100,000 this past year because of COVID, but I'm assuming going forward, it's gonna go back to the $50,000 limit. But you can, so you can borrow against it. You cannot borrow from an IRA, right? You'd have to make a withdrawal. So one question to ask is, right? Will I likely in the next few years need to borrow against the 401k balance? That would include you to potentially leaving it in the 401k and then rolling it over to the new company 401k when you get a new job. Now, you're not going to be able to borrow from your old company's 401k. In fact, it's the opposite. Typically, when you leave a company, you have to repay the 401k loan because typically your repayment is, you know, through a payroll deduction, right? So once you leave, they're going to want that, that money to be paid back, right? If you don't, it becomes a distribution and taxable. Um, so that would be one where, okay, I, you would wait till you get a new, a new job and then roll it to the new company 401k. The other advantage of a 401k versus an IRA, uh, which touched on a little bit earlier, is that with an IRA, I'm assuming most people are familiar, right? If you take a distribution that's not for some special exception, before you're 59 and a half, you have to pay the tax, but you also have to pay a 10% penalty, right? The, the IRS is encouraging these accounts to save for retirement. And if you're pulling something out when you're 45, they're assuming you're not retired yet, so you're going to pay a penalty, right? Um, but with a, with a 401k, a qualified retirement plan, if you draw the money out and, and you leave service, now here's the key, you have to have left service in the year you turn 55 or later. And it could be later in the year. You could leave in February and turn 55 in October, and that counts. But then you could actually take money out of the 401k, not pay the 10% penalty. 
So typically when I got clients in that 55 to 59 and a half age range, I generally recommend that they keep the money in the old 401k, okay, just in case, right, something comes up and they want to take a distribution. Then when they get to 59 and a half and then it doesn't matter anymore, then they can roll it to an IRA. So those are really the two reasons why you keep not a, that second one. That means it's got to stay in the old company 401k. Because if you roll it to the new company 401k, now you've no longer left service and that exception no longer applies. Okay. If you, those two don't really apply to you, then uh, generally it makes sense to roll over uh, to an IRA uh, because it has a little bit more flexibility. Uh, there's a no 10% penalty for first time home buyers, which is typically not the case uh, for folks that are, that are at these meetings. But, but the second one, it, you know, is more likely, right? You, you don't pay a 10% penalty uh, for withdrawals for hot qualified higher education expenses. Uh, and I'll be honest, this is something I'm doing right now, in fact. And so um, now one thing to be aware of is that will affect financial aid. So if you're going to qualify for financial aid, you've got to be very careful about taking money out of an IRA or a 401k because that's income. And that's going to affect your, your financial aid in future years. Um, now, the thing about financial aid is that it goes back two years now. And so if you're using this to pay junior or senior year of college and you don't have you know, uh, uh, students that are younger, uh, then you can take the money out and it's not going to have any impact. And that's essentially what I did. I waited till my, my younger son was a junior and then started drawing out the pay because it wasn't going to affect financial aid any longer, right? Um, and then the other advantages, uh, is, as I talked about earlier, you no 10% penalty if you take money out uh, to pay for your medical insurance premiums if you have been collecting unemployment for at least 12 weeks. That's true for an IRA, but not for a 401k. So that's something you want to take advantage of. You'd want to roll the money over. You've got much broader investment options in an in a IRA, right? You can pretty much buy anything that's out there, individual stocks, mutual fund, I mean, index funds, you name it. ETFs, you can buy anything. With a 401k, you're limited to whatever fund options, right, that the uh, investment advisor uh, that your employer worked with uh, had selected for you, right? And usually, you know, it's 15 funds or something you could pick from versus unlimited funds. Now, you do have to think about the fees, right? If you're going to take money out of a, a relatively low fee, uh, you know, 401k, uh, and then roll it into uh, to an IRA, you're going to pay an advisor 1% and they're going to put it to high fee funds or something, then you're probably going to be paying more fees, right? Uh, if you're going to take money out of a, a 401k that doesn't have very good fund options, there tend to be more higher fee fund options, and you roll it into an IRA and you, you invest in your know, Vanguard index funds or something, then it's probably going to make more sense, okay? And then the other advantage of an IRA is, again, one of our favorite tax planning uh, strategies, right, is to use Roth conversions. And we do this not necessarily just for folks in job transition. This is one situation where income can really fluctuate. But really, when a lot of our clients, when they get into their 60s, um, have these kinds of situations where, um, you know, now you're uh, maybe you stopped working um, and you're maybe 64, but you're not going to collect Social Security until 70. You don't have to draw your requirement distributions until you're 72. And so you've got these few years where you're going to be in a low tax bracket. And Roth conversions are one of the tools that we use to try to figure out how do we pay that tax at the lowest possible rate, right? So we do a tax forecast into the future. What's your tax rate going to be when you're 72? What is it now? Would we rather take the money out now or take the money out later? And if you don't need the cash, you can, you know, do a Roth conversion, pay the tax now at a later now, and then you don't pay it later, essentially, at a higher rate. Um, and you also don't have to uh, uh, necessarily roll the whole thing over, although that depends on the employer. Uh, it's really up to them, right? You know, you could leave some of the money in the old 401k and roll some to an IRA, uh, leave, you know, roll some to a new 401k and some to an IRA. It depends on whether the employer uh, is going to give you that flexibility, but it doesn't have to be all or nothing necessarily. Okay. Uh, let's see, question. Uh, tax efficient to refinance a purchase without income. Well, it's not so much a tax efficient option. I mean, the issue is going to be refinancing real estate without an income is whether they'll whether they're going to give you money. I mean, I've had clients where what we've had to do is start, you know, distributions from their IRA, right, on a regular basis to count that as income, right, because otherwise they didn't have enough income to qualify. So it's not really a tax play as much as it is, you know, how can you get refinanced? Will the bank lend you money without the, the, the income? Uh, can you leverage a stock portfolio as collateral uh, but not selling? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can borrow. Uh, the question is, I mean, I haven't had a lot of people using, uh, you know, stocks as collateral. 
Um, so I'm not super familiar with the with the rules. We tend to buy, you know, straight cash, not on margin. I'm not sure what the loan, you know, depends on what the interest rate is and whether they can allow you to borrow that for anything other than purchasing securities with them. I'm not sure that the brokerage firms let you just take the money out. I mean, the other option, if you're looking for, you don't have home equity available, you know, if you've got a cash value life insurance policy, you can borrow against that and generally get a pretty low rate. Um, and so it all depends. Um, and I know that's sort of a complicated question, and uh, but uh, so you could certainly call us if you if you want more specifics on that. And Joe, be careful with uh, uh, trust and massive limited partnerships that can be taxed. Yeah, those are pretty kind. I just yeah, those tend to be high fees. I stay away from those anyway. Uh, but it all depends. Question: Where can well, with the ACA in comparison between uh, ACA and Cobra? Probably the best thing to do. So you just give me a call. I can walk you through whatever questions that you have. Uh, our information is going to be here at the end. Here, I'll, I'll have my contact information and just give me a ring. And I can. Bill, yeah. the man, the royalty trusts and the master limited partnership. There is a little, not very well known clause in the tax code that it is income due to unrelated business, uh, whatever. And oh, so you can actually not be a qualified investment. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. You got to be careful uh, in general, right? Yeah, those are, those are tricky, to be honest. I, I stumped my tax attorney on that. He had to yeah. look it up. Yeah, I don't have a lot. Of, I mean, I'll just be honest with you. I don't really recommend those typically, so I haven't had a lot of experience with those. But yeah. I, I keep it simple, my, my, my personal opinion, yeah. They, they pay uh, high dividends, which attracted me. That's why I ended up down that road. Yep, yeah, sure. Uh, just a few comments on debt, right? If you are in a situation where you do have to take on some debt, right, because of cash flow issues, right? Certainly, which we just kind of touched on a little bit, right? You want to tap your lower rate sources of credit first, right? Things like home equity loans, right? If you can get it, uh, cash value policy loans uh, before you take on credit card debt, which is obviously going to be at a high rate. Um, you know, you want to understand if you do have to use credit cards, what rates are you paying, right? Rates on cash advances are often higher, for example than on purchases. So just be aware of what the rate you're really paying is and when the interest starts kicking in. Um, you know, you want to just as a good practice just to verify your credit reports annually, you're, you know, you're allowed to do that. Now, remember, credit reports are different than your credit score, right? So the way it works is you've got three big credit bureaus, right? Experian, uh, Equifax, and TransUnion that collecting all this information on you, and they have all this data. Then there's an algorithm that gets applied to that, that data, right? The, the, the one that's you know most widely known is FICO, which is Fair Isaac. And FICO makes a lot of money, right? Based on that algorithm by sipping into the data from the credit bureaus. The credit bureaus have now um, you know, created their own thing called Vantage Score, which is basically their own algorithm. So they don't have to pay, so FICO doesn't have to pay money or they have to pay FICO money rather. Um, but either way, you can actually get your credit report and actually look for it. And I had an issue where my wife had, you know, some medical bill from way back that we thought was resolved and it wasn't and created an issue for us. So I just want to be aware of that. Uh, you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be maxing out your credit limits on your, on your credit cards, right? That is going to have a negative impact on your score. You want to keep your balance right under 30% of your limit. You certainly want to pay more than a minimum due if you're able. That is going to improve your credit score. Um, and then uh, certainly don't want to miss any payments, right? And so they don't want to go to collections, right? That's going to have the biggest ding uh, on your credit score. Okay. A couple of comments on college. Uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, if you have a change in circumstances, especially since now, right, the FAFSA is done two years prior, right, um, that, you know, things could be very well different now than they were when you filled it out originally. Uh, and so, you know, certainly reach out to the financial aid office if you've got a change in circumstances. They may or may not be able to help. You know, I think I tend to find that uh, private schools got a little bit more flexibility than the state schools do, but it's certainly not going to get it if you don't ask. So you certainly want to reach out and see what can be done. Um, and this is more just a general topic. You know, I think a lot of people get saying, hey, oh, we're never going to qualify financial aid because of our income. But realize a lot of the financial aid that's being given, in fact, the majority is merit-based, not need-based. And really merit-based aid is really just a discount of tuition is what it really is, right? I mean, school wants the student for whatever reason, and so they're going to offer a discount to entice them to come. It could be academics, right? Uh, students in the top quarter class are often offered uh, merit aids uh, to them, and which are essentially subsidized by the students in the bottom half of the class. So the example I like to give, you know, a student who can get into Harvard, right? Duke might offer that student, you know, an aid package to entice them to come to Duke. And a student to get into Duke 
you know, Lehigh might offer, uh, you know, an A package to get that student to come to Lehigh and the student get to Lehigh. You know, Muhlenberg might offer, you know, an A package to get them and down the line. So there is going to be a school where, you know, the student might be in the top quarter of the class, wherever that is on the hierarchy, and that school is likely to offer A uh, to try to entice them to come. Could be geography. You know, we used to live in Minneapolis, and Minneapolis is not on the radar of Minnesota schools with the crowd in New Jersey. And so we looked at some Minnesota schools and both my sons were offered nice merit aid packages from Minnesota schools because they were trying to increase their visibility here uh, in the East Coast. Um, you know, what a school in Boston, not so much, right? As, uh, you know, Boston schools are swamped with students from New Jersey and they don't necessarily care about any more students from New Jersey. So you won't get that for that reason. Uh, it could be, um, you know, uh, athletics, it could be, uh, extracurriculars, you know, students as a violent impresario and the opportunities of violence, you never really know. So don't always just rule out uh, private schools, for example, because of the initial tuition, because you don't really know what kind of aid package they're gonna be willing to offer. Uh, and then I talked about earlier, you know, you could take money out of IRAs uh, without paying a 10% penalty if you require for higher education expenses. Mm -hmm. Then my little rant on fees um, that I talked about, uh, you know, you really do want to be careful about any fees that you pay. Uh, it doesn't seem like a lot if you're paying somebody 1%, right? But it adds up. Um, and so here's an example of a $250,000 portfolio. Um, and, you know, that 1% over 30 years would reduce the ending portfolio, you know, by 600000 Now you can make the argument is, is that person earning their 1% by delivering a performance better than what the market average would be? And the thing to understand is that it's very, very difficult to do because it's a zero sum game. Meaning, you know, and it's not that these folks managing these funds aren't very smart. The problem is, is they're all very smart. And so you have to be better than the other person. So if somebody does all their research and decided today's the day to buy Apple stock, some other very smart fund manager did all their research and decided today the day was to sell Apple stock. One of them in the short term is gonna be right. One of them is gonna be wrong. And you don't really know. And so those tends to average out. So by definition, right, half of the fund managers are going to do better than the market in a given year and half are going to do worse because the market is just the average of all of those decisions those folks are making. And so instead, right, uh, and, and I think the, you know, Vanguard did a study that said, okay, so obviously half, you know, are better and half worse in a year. That's before fees. Once you consider the fees that are charging you to do all that analysis, right? Only about 30% beat the market. And that's in one year. Over 15 years, and it wasn't always the same person, but over 15 years, it ends up being about 18% beat the market, you know, over a 15-year period. And if you knew at the beginning who was going to be the 18% that did better, you'd give them your money. The problem is there's no way to know at the beginning. And there's no variable that anybody's proven, whether it be past performance or anything else, determine who will, who will be. So what we advocate doing is forgetting all of that and you buy what's called an index fund. And what an index fund is, is it just owns all the stock in the market, right? You don't try to pick whether this stock's gonna do better than that stock. You just own them all. And then your fees, it's just a computer tracking the 500 stocks in the S&P, for example. And so the costs are very low. Fees are 0.04% instead of, you know, 1% or 0.8%. Or, uh, you know, we talked about earlier, somebody, you know, has a portfolio of individual stocks. You could do that as well. God, there's gonna be a lot more work. Um, to keep track of it all, but that also, uh, you know, gets rid of those fees as well. Uh, but anyways, just be very aware that uh, that this can really be, uh, it could really add up. Okay. And my uh, last little rant is this going to be on Social Security. Um, you know, when to take Social Security, uh, and I touched on a little bit before, but, you know, in general, right, about half the country right now takes Social Security at the earliest possible date, which is at 62, Okay. Um, and then most of the rest of the people take it at their full retirement age, which right now is 66, but it's going to be creeping up to 67, okay, over the next few years. Um, and the question is, when is it really the best to take uh, Social Security? And our advice to nearly all our clients is to wait until the latest possible time, uh, which is age 70. And this kind of, this chart tries to explore it's made our logic, right? People will talk about the break-even point, when do you break even? But I don't necessarily think about that as the right way to think about it. The whole point of, uh, you know, retirement planning is to make sure that you don't run out of money as long as you're alive, right? That's the whole idea. So let's just use this as an example, right? If you knew you were going to get hit by a bus at 72, well, then, yes, you'd be better off taking, you know, at, at 62, right? And if you knew for sure you were going to live to 95, now this is the bottom right 
uh, corner, you would file at 70 because you'd get a lot more money, right? 1.9 million versus 1.3 million, right? Because of the increase in social security, because it goes up 8% every year that you wait. But the issue is you don't know, right? How long you're gonna live. And so now let's do the scenarios where you sort of guessed wrong, right? Uh, the first scenario is, hey, you, you, you waited till 70 file and then two years later, you get hit by a bus, right? It's true, you did not get as much money out of um, Social Security as you could have, right? 113 versus 295. But, you know, in theory, you should not have run out of money at age 72 had you planned, you know, adequately for uh, your retirement. The other hand, right, the top red corner, right, the top corner on the right, that's really, in my view, the sort of a definition of the retirement crisis of America. You've got a lot of people who take the minimum, you know, the minimal amount of Social Security because they filed the earliest possible date and then they live to a long age. And now you're talking about, and oftentimes it's the wife because the husband might die before them, trying to live on you know $20,000 a year. Um, so it's people think intuitively the safe thing to do is to draw social security early and let their portfolio grow. But actually in most cases, uh, if, if you've got the resources to get to 70, which you know people that come to people like us do, uh, you're generally better off doing the opposite. Right, live off the portfolio from 64 to 70. I'm not saying you got to work till 70, right? Retire at 63 or 64 or whatever, but just draw off the portfolio from 64 to 70, let Social Security grow, and now you've got that income adjusted amount basically for the rest of your life. So just a little rant on, on Social Security, but all things being equal, we generally advise uh, folks to wait. And I don't know that there were any questions, right? Uh, yeah, I don't think so. And that's what we've got. Here's our contact information. We do have a blog. If you know if you're interested, we won't actually call you or anything. We'll just put you on the blog. You can cancel anytime. So you can you know put your email in the chat or shoot us an email and we'll add you to blog. If you're interested, we just try to get it out once a month. Um, and um, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions, but that's what we've got for today. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, you, know, you, health insurance or you know uh, anything financial planning related. Certainly, just give us a ring. Yes, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Sean. Uh, folks, an opportunity uh, for the next moment or two to ask a question, either if you want to post it or unmute. Otherwise, um, here is uh, contact information. And uh, also, I just put that in chat, uh, Bill's contact information and Sean's contact information. So uh, you can reach out to them and they are very friendly and helpful. I think you'll get a lot of good information from them. All right, let me turn going this on. Going once, going twice. So, and the blog, and, and I, I do receive their blogs uh, when they post them. A lot of good information, a lot of uh, sensible, help you understand uh, either pros and cons or the t subjects that they're talking about all around some kind of financial planning topic or something personal to you. Oh, Mandy uh, maybe is asking. About SEP, uh, do you mean, uh, I'm assuming about a SEP IRA? Is that what you mean by SEP, Mandy? Our special enrollment period. Mandy, you could unmute real quick and just yeah. answer Okay, that. yeah. It is a, the SEP IRA and how to set up and what the benefits if you can have a high level. Oh. In yeah, so a SEP IRA. So if you're self-employed, right, and obviously you're no longer qualified for a um, – for a uh, you know 401k, for example, through work, you really have a couple of options, right? One is a SEP IRA, right, which is easier to do, and and the amount you can contribute is if you're self-employed, it's basically 20% of your net income. It's a little more complicated than that, but roughly it ends up being about 20% uh, of your net income is the amount that uh, you can uh, contribute. Uh, the other option, if you wanted to get more money in there, is you can do a solo 401k. It's a little more involved getting it set up, but with a solo 401k you can do up to the amount that you could normally contribute to a regular 401k, right? Either 19,500 or 26,000, right? Depending on, on whether you qualify for the catch up, you're over age 50. And on top of that, you could put whatever's left over 20% of that uh, in. So you can get more money in with a solo 401k. But the advantages is like the same advantage as doing a regular 401k. You're putting money in pre-tax, you're taking a tax deduction for it. Uh, and then uh, you know you'll pay money when you pull the money out. So it's the same thing as a, as a 401k, basically, um, except by, from from a tax standpoint, it's the same. Okay. But isn't SEP is uh, contributed before tax? It's before tax money. Yep. Well, you take it's a little the mechanics work a little different, right? With a, with a 401k, that money's coming out pre-tax, right? With a SEP IRA, you're putting the money in, and then you take a tax deduction, 
on your tax return, right, on Schedule One. But so mm-hmm. you end up in the same place. It ends up being pre-tax, and then you then you take the money out uh, essentially when you when you pull it out. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Sure. 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 Uh, oh, looking for the distribution. Okay, so we'll we'll make sure we grab all of those. Sorry, if you mind just grabbing those, that'd be great. Yeah, and you know, well, what you can do, an easy way, you can download the chat. Oh, there we go. So we're just so low tech. So, we're yeah, finance yeah. So, guys, Bill, but when it comes to this kind of stuff. Don't worry, Bill, I have it, don't worry. I okay, it. yeah, and also, uh, folks, what I do each week, I will also be downloading the chat at the end of our program, so it'll be available to all of us, or uh, Sean, uh, if you miss one or two later, I'll just send you that file, You'll you'll have it. Or if you know how to download it, fine. It's in the upper left corner. The go to meeting icon in the upper left corner, if you click on it, it's a menu and you can save the chat log locally. And that's for anybody if you want to save your chat log. But gentlemen, thank you so much. Always a wealth of information. And one thing I certainly appreciate, uh, Bill, ha- that you've been here for uh, our group and others for a few years. This is not a wealth management sales type of financial planning presentation. These are really things that are very uh, near and dear to folks that are in job search and the the things that are most important uh, today and that we can use going forward. So I really value um, not only your participation, but the type of information that you've selected to provide to the group. So again, thank you so much. Sure. So folks, I just want to let you know as we wrap up, things that are um, going on. And then in a moment or two, we will turn off the recording, uh, but want to let you know next week, we will be right back here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, PSG of Mercer County will be here on October 1st at 10 o'clock. Deborah Wheatman will be back. Career coach Deborah Wheatman will be talking about personal branding and why personal branding and how to use it effectively in your job search. So that'll be next week, October 1st. And then I guess a good segue topic for all this financial planning and uh, age-related stuff that Bill and Sean brought up, um, Ed Samuel will be here on October 8th, assessing your career at any age. So Bill has apparently given us all permission to retire at age 63 or 64, but until we get to that age or if we want to keep working at any age, Ed will be talking about assessing your career at any age. So that's what's coming up over the next couple of weeks here. And also on Mondays, Uh, At 10.30 in the morning, PSG of Central Jersey meets. You can find them at psgcnj.biz, psgcnj.biz. And our other cousin organization, PSG of Morris County, meets on Wednesday mornings at 9.30, psgmc.org, psgmc.org. So that is our program for today. Uh, Thanks again to uh, Bill and to Sean for uh, presenting to us. And for everyone else, have a happy Aloha Friday and have a terrific weekend. And until we get to see you again, I'll simply say, bye, everybody.